Well, good afternoon. It's an honor to be here and uh, collaborate with Alex on our presentation today. A key theme in what he shared with you was about collaboration and trust. And you'll see that interwoven with the IHI, high impact leadership, mental models, high impact behaviors, and the template uh, that I'll uh, share with you today. You can hire for collaboration and trust, you can develop it in frontline leaders and colleagues, and you can build an organization that nurtures and grows people with trust and collaboration. Last year at the uh, National Forum in America at IHI, uh, Len Berry and I led a, an excursion to Darden. Uh, it's a brand that probably none of you know, but it, it is the largest full-service restaurant company in the world. They employ 200,000 people. They have 2,100 restaurants. And the placement of those 2,100 restaurants is their business. And so they have rich analytics to understand which restaurants will succeed, and they want to optimize uh, the likelihood of success. And they look at the salaries of people in communities, they look at the demographics, they look at the competition, they look at location of the building. And some of that's helpful, but what was the single most important factor in determining the success of the restaurants? It was who the manager was. In spite of all the other deep analytics, if they had a good manager or leader for that store, that was the best predictor of success. And we know that intuitively, we know it um, organically, uh, and they've proven it statistically. If you have a good leader, your workers, your doctors, your nurses, your pharmacists, your administrators, whatever the organization, they're more engaged. And an engaged colleague is more productive, they engender better patient and customer satisfaction. At Mayo Clinic, I can tell you, if we didn't have that discretionary effort, if people just did their job description, we wouldn't exist. It's that volunteerism that goes above and beyond the job description that is a key differentiator and, and, and uh, identifier of a, of a key leader, of an effective leader. So for the last two years, uh, we, a group of us, uh, intensely researched uh, a leadership model for the triple aim, to improve care, improve the health populations, and to reduce costs. In essence, this, is, this work is, is the evolution of three decades of work of IHI in collaboration with uh, medical centers across the world. And we tried to put it into an imperfect model and there are three parts of the model. It's available on the IHI website as a published, uh, peer-reviewed white paper. First part is about mental models, what leaders need to think about challenges and solutions. Then we have five high-impact behaviors that came out of our uh, research and uh, intensive interviews face-to-face -face with uh, top leaders in, in, in the world, in healthcare. And the third piece is where leaders need to focus, and that's this uh, high-impact leadership framework, which will be what I'll focus on in, in this uh, uh, session today uh, and, and the others uh, there won't be time for. So this is what this uh, framework looks like. And at the middle is driven by persons and community, which is what brings us all to healthcare, and that's why our hearts are in our uh, passion for the work that we do, that that's connects us and that grounds us in, uh, it's, it's why we have our, our uh, calling to this space. So at Mayo Clinic, if you come into an emergency room, uh, one of our emergency rooms with chest pain, and it's a low risk chest pain, you and your family uh, is engaged in a shared decision making conversation. We look at the, we explain in a templated way the risks and the benefits of having an invasive cardiac procedure, like a, an angiogram here, or going home in a, under observation with a, a free access to come back if, if things uh, change in your care. 
with a shared decision-making model for patients with chest pain, what happens? The vast majority of patients and their family members say, I'm going home. I don't want any more tests. And the results, we publish these results now, the results are the patient, the people, and their families are more satisfied with their care. The providers are more satisfied with that discussion. Saves thousands of dollars per encounter, and no one gets any heart attacks that wouldn't have otherwise happened. So it's the triple aim. And it happens because the conversation is driven by people and communities for the community and those people, not by doctors and providers and nurses in an emergency room. I had a chance to meet uh, Christian Farman um, earlier this year, in January, in Jungshipung, Sweden. He was an avionics engineer for uh, Saab uh, until, and an accomplished athlete until he developed glomerulonephritis that put his kidneys uh, out of whack and he needed to be on dialysis. He didn't like being a patient. He wanted to be a person. And so during his uh, dialysis um, days, he talked to Britt Marie, one of the uh, uh, nurses in the dialysis unit, and said, I can do this myself. And I do a better job of it myself. And I can do it as often as I need it if you just let me. And so she taught him how to do the dialysis. And he started a wonderful wave of engagement of other dialysis patients. So now in this area in Jungshipping, Sweden, uh, over two-thirds of the patients, of the people that need, self -dial need dialysis, take care of it themselves. And that's a nice, heartwarming story. And, it, and for Christian, it, it gave him his life back, his freedom, and he's back to work now, but not as an engineer or mechanic, but as a, uh, as a nurse. But the, but the story doesn't end there. It's safer. There are fewer infections. The cost of what Christian started with Britt Marie uh, lowers expenses for that unit by a third and dramatically increases satisfaction. So this is, these are the kind of stories that we are looking for to be sure that we have our care driven by people and driven for the community. In order to understand people and uh, the community, providers have to be aware of cultures from all over the world, like we see in Paris and like we see at this, uh, this conference. Uh, I come from Midwest in, in America, and during World War II, we hosted um, German prisoners of war. And one of my favorite foods is corn on the cob with uh, lots of butter and a little bit of salt. And so in the 40s, I wasn't around then, we, we, as hosts for these prisoners of war, we thought we'd feed them some of our corn, which we're proud of in the Midwest. And they were insulted, because at least in the 40s, Germans fed corn to pigs. We were culturally insensitive, and, and so we, that's a huge problem in our diverse societies. And and at Mayo, here's what we do. So for every physician, we have 4,100 physicians. To become a Mayo Clinic physician, you have to first have three years of, of uh, probationary employment. And during that three years, we do many things, including three days work on professionalism. And part of that professionalism, there's a whole day on communication. How do physicians communicate to nurses and other doctors and administrators, but most importantly, how do they communicate with people, patients um, th that they're uh, partnering with? And, and so we have four hours in a simulation center where we um, have conversations with uh, professional actors from Somalia that are gay or lesbian, from Europe, from all over, so, so we have a better cultural sensitivity of, uh, and are better able to have our care be driven by uh, 
people and community. If we don't understand the cultures, we're going to fall short of meeting expectations and lose out in communication. That's the center, driven by persons and community. The next of the six domains that we have in our white paper for high-impact leadership is to create vision and to build will. So the year after uh, Muhammad Yanis received his uh, uh, Nobel Peace Prize for um, the Grameen Bank and the micro loans that uh, he set up, we had him visit Mayo Clinic to explore options that, uh, that we could do with him in, in health care. What he did, Maureen Bizignano talked yesterday about flipping health care. Muhammad Yanis flipped banking. So he, in the, one of the poorest countries in the world, Bangladesh, did everything backwards. So he flipped it. So instead of giving loans to the lowest risk people, he gave loans to the highest risk people. Instead of giving big loans, he gave loans for five, 10, 15, 25 dollars. Instead of giving loans to men, he gave loans to women. Instead of visiting your banker once at the beginning and maybe at the end of your uh, period of, of indebtedness in an armored truck, their bankers were on bicycles visiting weekly with mainly the women who had borrowed $18 to buy a goat or a sewing machine to start a small business. And their payback rate uh, is you know, high 90%, I think it's 97%. So it's a self-sustaining business. He didn't want donations. He wanted no charity. He wanted this to be able to work for itself. He it was driven by the people in that community. And that's how you build will. You build will not by talking about the business and how you're going to make money. Delivering medical care is a business, and we have to run it like that. But that's not how we work with nurses and doctors and pharmacists, administrators and techs. They're taking care of patients, and the business is to support their care of patients. And, and that's how you, you build will and connect them. There are about uh, 12,000 names on this uh, slide, and uh, we have another two like that. And these are our names of our silver gold fellows and our gold uh, quality fellows at Mayo Clinic. We build will around the needs of the patient come first. That's our core value. And we look at our job in healthcare as having two jobs to do our work and to improve our work. And to improve our work, we have to have a basic systems competency in understanding of systems and processes in their role in high reliable care of patients. And so we started a quality academy over a decade ago now. Included in that is this quality fellows program where now over 30,000 of our 61,000 uh, colleagues at Mayo have been certified as a bronze, silver, gold, or diamond quality fellow, which is a rough equivalent of ASQ, yellow belt, green belt, black belt, and master black belt. And except for leaders for whom we acquire it, most of those 30,000 colleagues that are now certified did it because they wanted to help. And they knew that if they took some time to learn about the basics of performance improvement and to understand the basics of, uh, and to run a project, that they could uh, be part of our mission more than just doing their work. The flywheel uh, that Jim Collins talks about in his book, Good to Great, doesn't get going by a handful of leaders. But if we have 30,000 employees putting a few ergs of energy into that, it gets going. And then it keeps going. It takes the whole community if we're going to conquer uh, high reliability in healthcare. And then it just spreads spontaneously. So we have, uh, we have 24 hospitals in six states. We have... Uh, um, I think 84 uh, uh, outpatient clinics across uh, different parts of America. And in uh, 11 years ago, we had uh, nine different ways to make scrambled eggs. Well, big deal. But our chefs saw that nurses were using checklists and doctors were proposing standard work to be safer, efficient, more reliable, more patient-centered. So they had a bake-off. 
because everybody else was moving to best practices, and now we have one way to make scrambled eggs at Mayo Clinic. Everyone needs to be involved to have this work. So the, uh, the third piece of our framework relates to developing capability. And I'll just have time to give you one example, but this includes everything from data to uh, systems engineers to um, the, the capability to, uh, to address um, and to overcome uh, what we need to for um, quality improvements and performance improvement. We developed a Mayo Clinic diffusion model because we know that we found over the decades that the best practices and the safe practices don't spread fast enough if we, as if we were the patient. We need to deliberately move them to every nook and cranny of Mayo in a formal way like this with a diffusionist at each of our medical centers to make sure that we've accomplished that. How long did it take America to deliver beta blockers to heart attack patients? Something that in 1982 we knew was absolutely uncontroversially the best, safest thing to do. It saved lives left and right after heart attacks if you had a beta blocker. It took us 20 five years and six weeks to have 90% of American patients that should have a beta blocker after a heart attack get one. So across a nation, across a medical center, diffusion doesn't happen to the extent that we need it for our people and our community uh, unless we deliberately try to do that. So I, I'll tell you about a situation we had um, nine years ago. We looked at our uh, anticoagulation uh, of, of, of blood. It was actually, warfarin was discovered in Wisconsin back in the 1930s where I grew up by a farmer who he couldn't coagulate his milk and make uh, cheese and butter out of it because his cows were eating this rotten sweet clover which eventually became warfarin or coumarin. Well, it's a life-saving drug today, uh, but it also is high risk and you can kill patients uh, inadvertently if the levels are too low or if they're too high. So we looked across Mayo Clinic at our 24 hospitals for the inpatient use of this anticoagulation drug and found high variation. We found centers as low as you could get uh, without genetic testing, which is about 1.1%, all the way up to 45 4.6% defect rate, where the blood was too thin, it wasn't thin enough, or the rate of anticoagulation was too steep. So we said, that's not good enough. We, we need to have everybody performing as well as this one hospital in our system, 1.1%. So we went out there and looked at this positive deviance. And what they had done is they had uh, looked at their data and they put together an algorithm that was activated by computerized physician order entry. It was run by the pharmacist and, and executed that. And it took a little while, it took us about a year of discussions across all our hospitals, uh, saying, well, their patients are different than ours, uh, the data's not right, but eventually we got over it, and uh, we said, this, if you're gonna be a male clinic physician, you're going to use this algorithm to anticoagulate patients. We encourage you to opt out, but if you opt out, it has to be for a patient-centered reason. And so today, the whole system uses the same algorithm run by pharmacists, and our defect rate is just over 1%, as low as we think we can get right now without genetic testing. And we hit the trifecta. We improve the care of patients. It's safer for patients. We made the life of frontline workers easier because the doctors and residents aren't getting paged all the time with these. It's, it's handled in a standard way, so they're freed up to think more than just react. Patients' uh, complications went down, and we saved money. That's the trifecta of a performance improvement, and we spread it to every side of Mayo Clinic. So like Mohamed Yanis, uh, you don't focus on the business side of microloans. You focus on what the community and what the people of the community want, and that was an opportunity to start a business in this case, in flipping uh, finance. But finances are important. Mayo Clinic is not-for-profit. We're a $9 billion not-for-profit corporation. But we still need to make a margin to sustain our mission. And performance improvement done the right way gives you a margin. 
This is my brother, David. Uh, he's, uh, uh, he's a year and a half older than I am. He's better looking. He's smarter. He's got more hair than I do. He makes a whole lot more money than I do. Um, he's a chief investment officer at Yale. Runs about a $22 billion uh, portfolio. And for 27 years, his results of 14.3% are the number one in the Cambridge Index, the best in the country for endowments and for retirement funds. But 14.3% is nothing compared to what we can do in quality. We published this. Co-author on the publication is, was our chief financial officer at Mayo Clinic at the time. We can guarantee a 5 to 1 return, hard dollar return on investment for the, a portfolio of improvement work that is patient-centered to drive out risk, vari variation, waste, and, and defect. Our, we have a $48 million, three-year rolling average return on investment. For every million dollars we invest, we can guarantee our top leadership at least $5 million. We're not doing it for money, but we've got it. what we have to do if we're going to succeed in this, this battle is to connect the improvement work not only to our mission and the moral imperative of becoming safe and more reliable, but also to the business strategy. So it's a business strategy. It's not just a necessary expense. If all you do are the compulsories and report 135 measures and do what the Joint Commission or your government tells you to do, um, then quality is an expense. It's still important, still worth doing, but if you go beyond that to looking at ways to streamline uh, and improve reliability, uh, that's where the real return comes in your portfolio of work. An important part of capability is the workforce and, and how they are able to come to work every day and perform at high levels. Ten years ago, uh, Legos uh, was losing a million dollars of cash every day. And today they have record profits. What they did is they went out, they tried a bunch of things, but what helped them is they went out to observe children playing. And they talked to an 11 and a half year old, 11 year old uh, German boy and asked him, uh, and observed him playing and asked him what he treasured. And he pointed to his sneakers. In his sneakers he had uh, uh, a couple scuffs and scrapes and he said, those happened when I was learning the new trick on my skateboard. What, they, what Legos found is that children and this 11-year-old German boy wanted to have some time to be creative, to build something that was meaningful to him. When girls and boys grow up as adults, we want the same thing. We want to be able to have some time to be creative at work, doing something that's purposeful and meaningful, and that's what healthcare is so wonderful for us to be able to take that care of that advantage. So what percent of physicians in America, which is the same as physicians in Europe, it's probably true across the world, I couldn't find data beyond Europe and America, are burned out? Four out of 10. About three out of 10 nurses are burned out. A burned out nurse, a burned out physician is an impaired physician that uh, is depersonalized and emotionally exhausted. There are five major consequences of a burned out healthcare provider that hurts the capability of a medical center to deliver the best possible care. They aren't as safe. Patients aren't as happy with them. They're more likely to um, reduce their hours. And, and, and so at Mayo, like many other places, we have a concerted effort to mitigate these five drivers of burnout. And the biggest drivers we found in our experience are like that 11-year-old German boy. If we give docs a little bit of time to be flexible, to do something they have a passion for, to support their care of patients, like teach or research or uh, develop a, a, a module, and connect them to the purpose and meaning of our organization, uh, th that's where we get the most uh, leverage. After we look at mitigating the drivers of burnout, then we look to build resiliency. Heart, mind, balance, mindfulness, diet, 
exercise, uh, forgiveness in these 12 habits of highly healthy people that we've built at Mayo. It's nothing, not rocket science, but we're taking care of our colleagues so that they can better take care of people and persons in the community. Culture is one of the key uh, elements of the leadership framework. And culture within an organization uh, can stop the best ideas and strategy if we don't uh, attend to it. And the best organizations in the world, every, every organization has a culture, and the best organizations in the world every day work to maintain that culture. Culture can be changed and reinforced one behavior at a time, and if there's one behavior that doesn't fit with the culture, then that has to be addressed, and it is by good leaders. Last year, uh, Nick Seibert uh, published this results of this study he did. And what he did with a little micrometer, he looked at the annual reports of Fortune 500 companies and measured the size of the signature of the president and CEOs of these most successful companies. And he found a relationship between the size of the signature and the profitability of the company. What do you think it was? The smaller the signature, the more likely the company was to be profitable. The bigger the signature, the more likely the company was to have trouble with their margin. Leaders matter. And so what we have to do at Mayo Clinic is hire leaders with small signatures. <laughs> and we actually don't look at their signature size, but we look at that personality trait. So, like I said, there are three years. We have 4,100 physicians at Mayo Clinic. There are three years that are probationary before we hire you. At the end of that first year, every physician and scientist undergoes an emotional intelligence assessment. Not to pass or fail, but to reflect on, um, am I collaborative? Can I engender trust in my team? And every physician and scientist we look at as a leader and a team member. At the end of the second year, we do a 360 analysis. So they get feedback from the nurses and the students and administrators and, uh, and physician colleagues with whom they work in order to better understand how they work as a team member. This is part of how an organization can build trust and collaboration by methodically going after uh, the self-assessments to understand how you fit in with a team and then build on that. And we offer coaching and mentoring for all of these new colleagues in order to help them fit in more with our system. This is a study done at the um, Newcastle in the uh, United Kingdom. The researchers uh, looked at uh, a way to increase the milk productivity of a cow. So what single thing did they find increased the milk productivity of a cow by 62 gallons a year? It was uh, 240 liters. So, they gave the name a cow, the cow a name, sorry, and they used it. And her milk productivity went up 62 gallons of milk a year. Well, guess what? The same thing happens to human beings. If you give, if you use someone's name, you treat them with respect, you engender trust and collaborate with them, they're not only does their productivity go up, like in cows, but their teamwork goes up, patient satisfaction goes up, their burnout rate goes down, they become a member of the team that's safer. About half of the, the most common cause of a sentinel event when you look at joint commission literature has to do with communication and handoffs. If the team members know each other, are comfortable with each other, and that power distant index between nurses and pharmacists and docs and students is diminished, you have a safer environment, and we have to lead to engender that. And we have to look at the results of the culture in our units. So we have 872 different inpatient, outpatient clinical units across our 24 hospitals and 80-some clinics in, at Mayo Clinic. And for each of them, we go with a culture safety survey to understand what about psychological safety, about teamwork, 
about how the leaders do in that area, and then we share the results with them. The teams look for rapid cycle improvement opportunities to improve their care of patients while they're talking about psychological safety and teamwork. What leaders pay attention to matters, and what you measure matters, and culture and culture of safety in particular is extraordinarily important for people and persons in the community that we serve, and we've got to measure it and work to it. So is transparency. So it was 10 years ago uh, this year uh, that uh, President Clinton had, his, had a heart attack. It wasn't a fatal heart attack, and he had the luxury of elective coronary artery bypass surgery that he chose to have done in New York City. There were many choices about which hospital to go to, and he chose the wrong one. He went to Columbia that had a risk-adjusted mortality rate for the exact surgery he had that was two and a half times higher than Cornell down the street. And all that information was readily available with a few mouse clicks since uh, Mark Chasson, Dr. Mark Chasson, who's now the President Joint Commission, at the time he was a commissioner of, of uh, health for the state of New York, made that all transparent for the whole world. I met, told this story at a conference a couple years ago, and a physician from Columbia came up to talk to me afterwards. And he said, you got the numbers right, but it wasn't President Clinton who picked the high-risk hospital. It was Hillary. <laughs> Transparency, like all of these cardiac surgery results in the state of New York, is a very, very powerful stool, tool for a country, for a state, for a city and a hospital. After Dr. Chasson and his team made that information available, what happened to the mortality rate for cardiac surgery in the state of New York? It plummeted 41%. And that 41% reduction in risk-adjusted mortality for cardiac surgery in the state of New York persists still today. Hundreds of people have been saved because of the trans the act of transparency of sharing the results. Now, it wasn't because patients chose to go to safer hospitals. It was because the doctors, the administrators uh, that, that ran the hospitals and, the, and did the surgery either stopped doing the surgery or improved the results to make it safer. It's one of the most powerful uh, arrows you have in your quiver, transparency. So the fifth of the six uh, parts of our framework um, is engaging across boundaries. And today, more than ever, this is a critical part of successful high-impact leadership. The boundaries of departments, the boundaries of inpatient, outpatient, the boundaries of administrator to physician to nurse to pharmacist. There's so many boundaries, most of which we've built ourselves in healthcare, that we've got to tackle. A few years ago, uh, one of our cardiac surgeons, Thor Sunt, and a human factors a PhD, um, Doug Wegman, and their administrator, uh, Brent Phillips, followed cardiac surgery patients that had routine uh, valve replacement from the outpatient setting to the discharge after the surgery, and um, with a video camera to learn all the opportunities for improvement and streamlining uh, from the view of the patients and their families. How many different different uh, unique individuals at Mayo Clinic touched with and had a role in the care of a single cardiac surgery patient. 148. A lot of different boundaries there you know, to, to connect up, to have seamless, patient-centered, uh, timely, effective uh, care. And how do you do that? Well, you can do it organizationally, um, and you can do it by... But one of the biggest drivers of this is... Um, what accounted for the main reason uh, that this one company was most profitable during this 25-year period. What was the most profitable company in America uh, from the 25 years ending in 2002? This is from uh, um, Jim Collins' work in Good to Great. It was Southwest Airlines, and the driver of it was relational coordination. The scholars got in there, tried to figure it out. They were as unionized as the others. This was in a sector where um, commercial aviation was hemorrhaging and recapitalizing hundreds of billions of dollars a year, and yet that's a sector where the most profitable company was, Southwest Airlines. 
38 years of straight profitability. She used this same tool, Dr. Gattel, in, in healthcare, relational coordination. It's a measure of uh, how um, people get along. Uh, in, in, in commercial aviation, it was how the captain related to the first officer and her navigator and the air traffic control and the ground crew. In healthcare, when she said healthcare, it was the doctors and nurses and, uh, and staff. And the same thing was true in healthcare. If you had high relational coordination measure of collaboration and trust uh, in your ICU or your orthopedic unit, you had shorter length of stay, you had more satisfied patients, patients needed uh, fewer narcotics for their pain. The value of a t cohesive team that gets to get along and collaborates and trusts each other is, has a real business impact in the outcomes for patients and for the bottom line. Brookings looked at this. Um, 30 years ago, the valuation of most uh, large companies in the world was bricks and mortar and technology. It was physical assets. In the 21st century, that flipped. The valuation of most of the uh, biggest companies, the best companies in the world now, is in the intangible assets of social capital and intellectual capital. So we look more like this. Social capital is the trust and interconnectedness of people and groups of people within an organization. The more connected you are, the, high, the higher the trust level, the higher the social capital, the better you are at learning and spreading and diffusing and trusting and working together as a team. And good leaders build this. They know how to do it like those Darden restaurant managers that are most successful. It comes down to leadership. You can also build this with uh, organizational structure. So the Mayo Clinic is, is as old as the uh, British underground. This is our 150th anniversary. We actually started by a W.W. Mayo from, uh, who came to America from, from England. We're the first and largest integrated multi-special group practice in the world. We have 4,100 docs. Every one of them, every one of our Mayo Clinic physicians is salaried. It's a pure salary system where there's no financial incentive to take out a gallbladder or to do a cardiac cath. There's no financial conflict, in, in, conflict of interest between the patient and the, um, uh, and the providers. It's like an orchestra. The woodwinds at Mayo Clinic also don't have a financial incentive. What's left over for cardiology or radiology or surgery doesn't go to them. It goes to Mayo Clinic, and then we redistribute it by committees led by physicians in partnership with, uh, uh, with um, physicians in partnership with excellent administrators. So it's, we had a visitor last year that described it as socialism run by Republicans. But it engenders trust and collaboration because the Goodwins have no financial conflict with other departments. It's a team approach to medicine. And the physician leadership and partner with administrators allows for engagement of providers with physicians who are still seeing patients and will rotate back into the care of patients full time after up to eight years as a, as a leader. It's a model that has some principles at work of engagement and connected with, with the practice and patient-centeredness. Diversity is also extraordinarily important for us. Um, the, the world's greatest orchestras have uh, blind auditions. So if you want to be a violinist for the Paris or London Philharmonic, you audition behind a closed screen or on a stage so the conductors don't know your skin color or your gender. And, a result, and the reason they do this is they want the best musicians. And after they started doing this, women were seven times more likely to be chosen. Diverse committees by gender and, and, and ethnicity think better, have better results than monocultural committees. And we've got to foster that in healthcare if we're going to have, make the right decisions and get the right strategies and operationalize those ideas. At our Board of Governors level and our 
uh, and our uh, management team level at Mayo, we always, for large strategic or capital decisions, appoint a devil's advocate. And that person's job, whether they agree with it or not, uh, is to give us all the reasons we shouldn't do this, um, make this big expenditure, or shouldn't go that way strategically, in order to engender good discussion and a respectful discussion that has diverse interests of ideas and backgrounds. And finally, this is all about delivering results, isn't it? No matter how good we feel about it, ourselves as a team and how connected we are across boundaries, no matter how, what we like about our vision and building well, we've got to be delivering results. The, two of the things we do that have been most successful in engaging frontline nurses, doctors, administrators, pharmacists, techs, is to talk about every significant harm event and every uh, significant, every death at Mayo Clinic in a non-threatening way, not with a back office, but with the front lines. So the deaths with issues, we look at, we have about 40 deaths a week. Most of them are anticipated, some of them aren't. Every one of them gets the same templated analysis by a cross-functional team involving frontline caregivers and providers to look at what, were there systems issues, and then the systems issues are addressed in a prioritized way, and that allows us to decrease the number of deaths with issues, ultimately to decrease the number of uh, deaths overall in a risk-adjusted uh, observed mortality rate and so on. So we're winding down to the end here, and I, so I'll close by saying this is an imperfect framework in a, in a white paper that aspired to put together the best practices, behaviors, mental models for healthcare leaders to deliver the triple aim. Our hope is that some aspects of it, and some of the learnings that we share in the white paper that's free and accessible on the IHI website, will be helpful to you in your care of patients, and the outpatient, and the inpatient, in the community, and all the transients in between to move us towards higher reliability care through high impact leadership. Thank you very much.